In this video, I'm going to be exposing Jean Harlow's toxic hair care routine that she used to dye her hair blonde. Hello lovelies, my name is Laura and today I'm bringing you a shocking expose on the secret of hair dye. Most people don't know this, but Jean Harlow, a one of the most iconic Hollywood stars of all time, used a toxic hair care routine that involved using ammonia and bleach. For centuries, women have been using hair dye to change their appearance. But what many don't realize is that hair dye has a long and toxic history. Early hair dyes were made from a variety of toxic ingredients including lead, arsenic, and even rat poison. These toxic ingredients could cause serious health problems including hair loss, cancer, and organ damage. In recent years, hair dyes have become somewhat safer, but they still contain a variety of toxic chemicals. Many of these toxic chemicals are known to cause cancer, reproductive damage, and other serious health problems. So the next time you reach for that box of hair dye, remember the toxic history of this dangerous product. We all know that feeling, the itch to change our hair color, to add a little spice to our lives, and so we reach for that hair dye. But what we don't realize is that we are playing with fire. Hair dye has a long and toxic history dating back to the early days of the 20th century. The first commercial hair dyes were made with toxic chemicals like lead and arsenic and they were incredibly dangerous to use. In fact, they were so toxic that they were actually banned in some countries but that didn't stop people from using them. In the 1930s, a new type of hair dye was developed that was made with less toxic ingredients, but even these dyes were not safe to use, and they could cause serious health problems like cancer. Today, hair dyes are still made with some of these toxic ingredients, and while they may not be as dangerous as they once were, they can still cause serious health problems. So the next time you're tempted to change your hair color, Think twice about using hair dye. It may not be worth the risk. Obviously, I'm guilty of dyeing my hair. I dye my roots every six weeks, so I understand. And there are a lot of many hazardous substances in hair dye that you should look out for. I mean, I think it's good to know and be aware of these things. One of the most well-known harmful components in hair color is ammonia. Its strong, offensive odor comes from it because it enables the color to pierce the hair cuticle and is utilized in hair coloring. However, it frequently has repercussions. This results in dry and damaged hair over time, as well as irritation to the throat and respiratory system from exposure to ammonia. And you can get a lot of hair dyes now that are free from that. And the next one is PPD. The current pigment in your hair is removed by PPD, allowing the new color to replace it. And this one can cause respiratory failure and cardiac health problems. And these are just a few concerns that result from using an excessive amount of this hazardous substance. And it's also a well-known carcinogen. So let's look into the origins of hair dye and how it developed into the product that Jean Harlow used in the 1930s. So it all started in 1500 BC. Given how advanced their culture was, it shouldn't really surprise us that the Egyptians experimented with hair dye as well. They would cover gray hair with henna, and yes, the preoccupation with gray hair dates all the way back then. Later, the Greeks and Romans colored their hair with plant extracts. They also produced a black hair dye that is permanent. They switched to a recipe created with leeches that had been fermented in a lead vessel for two months, though when they realized it, it was too poisonous to use. It took several hundred years to add colors other than black to the palette. In 300 BC, during the Roman Empire, prostitutes were required to have yellow hair to indicate their profession. Most wore wigs, but some use a mixture made from the ashes of burned plants or nuts to achieve the hue. Meanwhile, other ancient civilizations were dyeing their hair a variety of vibrant colors to show their rank and as a means of intimidating opponents on the battlefield. And 500 to 1500 AD, the earliest recorded instance of a redhead who was born naturally took place in Scotland during the Dark Ages when red hair first arose as a result of a genetic abnormality. People with naturally red hair have faced accusations of witchcraft for a long time. 
red hair didn't become more popular until the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. And now into the 1800s. Until the 1800s, when English scientist William Henry Perkin made an unintended discovery that forever altered hair dye. Not much has changed. In 1863, Perkins developed the first synthetic dye in an effort to find a malaria treatment. It was called Ma Movine and was a mauve color. Soon after, August Hoffman, his chemical professor, extracted from Movine a color changing molecule known as PPD which is the basis for the majority of permanent hair colors used today. And in 1907, young French chemist Eugene Schuler developed the first synthetic hair dye, L'Oreal, in 1907 using a combination of safe chemical substances. The dyes were significant advancement at the time since they offered a subtle range of hues in contrast to other commercially available techniques that employ henna or mineral salts but result in a bright, rather artificial looking appearance. Eugene Schuler registered two names for his product, L'Oreal, which was inspired by a hairstyle popular at the time called Laurel from the Latin Aureola, a luminous halo and black and gold, which is a logical brand name for hair color with black representing the spectrum of dark shades and gold the warm tones. And then a few months later, they came up with the name L'Oreal. L'Oreal was established in 1909 by Eugene Schuler. Even beyond France, L'Oreal hair dyes were a huge success, setting new standards in countries like Italy, Austria, the Netherlands, and even the United States. Canada, the United Kingdom, and Brazil in 1910, 1911, and in 1913. The little business that started in 1909 has grown to be the largest cosmetic company in the world. Have you ever pondered the origin of the term a golden blonde? You can thank Jean Harlow and Howard Hughes for that. In 1931, Hughes made a movie named Platinum Blonde to profit on the hair color of the young actress. Jean Harlow in what may be the most effective public relations move ever. Many admirers instantly imitated Harlow's hair color by doing the same. Hughes' team even established a network of Platinum Blonde clubs across the nation offering a $10,000 prize to any hairstylist who could re replicate Jean Harlow's hair color. It's ironic that Harlow never acknowledged to coloring her hair. Going blonde required bleach and a significant damage before the year 1950. Although Lawrence Gelb developed formulas in the 1930s, the actual groundbreaking finding wasn't made until 1950. The first one-step hair color that really lightened hair without bleaching it was introduced that year by Clarol, a firm Gelb created with his wife, Jane Clare. Miss Clarol Hair Color Bath, which allowed ladies to secretly color their hair at home. Essential because at the time, women preferred not to advertise that they dyed their hair. And this quickly gained popularity among the general public. Hair dye was stigmatized as a substance only used by women who walked the streets or performed on stages until the 1950s. The process of coloring hair was done in total secrecy. Women would enter private booths using discreet salon entrances. There were several pseudonyms like Mrs. Smith in appointment books. The answer to alter how women view hair color, foot cone and belding engaged Shirley Polykoff, the company's sole female copywriter. The first at-home hair color kit that could lighten tint, condition, and cleanse hair in one step was Miss Clarol, which debuted in 1956. The ideal approach to position Miss Clarol, according to Shirley Polykoff, was to give ladies the assurance that their hair color would appear so natural that no one would question whether it was their own. She quickly got to work and wrote the sentence, does she or doesn't she? Only her hairstylist is certain. This slogan continues to be one of the most successful in advertising history, even today. Always she looks lovely. Her hair sparkles with fresh, radiant color, and it looks so natural. Does she or doesn't she? 
Significantly, the majority of Clairol's copywriters have been women over the years, even for a sector that serves women. Along with Shirley Polykoff, remarkable contributions to Clairol advertisement has also been made by such prominent people in advertising as Mary Wells, Phyllis Robinson, Nadine Peterson, Lois Wies, and Lois Garassi Ernst. Another well-known 1950s ad reads, is it true blondes have more fun? <laughs> and this is a phrase that we still use today. And I always wondered about that phrase and I can't believe it actually came from a hair dye ad. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is it true blondes have more fun? Is it true blondes have more fun? Why not be a blonde and see? And into the 1960s, fearless and determined Lawrence Gelb had no problem taking a chance, a persistent philosophy that still defines Clarol. Gelb's own imagination served as an endless supply of inspiration for items like hook and cap, a method of at-home highlighting. The first highlighting at-home hair color kit to hit the shelves in the 1960s was called Frost and Tip. The first semi-permanent hair color that covered grays was introduced by Clairol in the same decade under the slogan, you're not getting older, you're getting better. Clairol, you're not getting older, you're getting better. Clairol's viewpoint hasn't altered at all. And in 1964, they had Clairol Carousel. Miss Clairol made a substantial investment in a distinctive exhibit in the form of a carousel. The only exhibit during the New York World Fair that was so exclusive was called the Clairol Color Carousel and it was solely accessible to females. There were one-way mirrors so women could try on various hair colors and there was a sizable staff who offered free hair and makeup tips. And another successful advertising campaign from 1965 is It Lets Me Be Me. With the beginnings of female emancipation, Clairol's It Allows Me Be Me marketing emphasized self-fulfillment and self-expression. In addition, some commercials allowed women to embrace who they already were and be whoever they wanted to be. The practice of coloring one's hair became widespread by the late 1960s, and 1968 marked the final year in which Americans required to indicate their hair color on their passports. Since hair dye was so widely used, this information was useless. And by the 1970s, attitudes in the public towards hair dyeing started to change. The open use of hair color products was pushed by slogans like L'Oreal's Because You're Worth It. Clearly the change in perspective was long lasting. The most significant factor for women in the 1970s was choice. A wide range of professions, including lawyers, laborers, sports stars, Scientists were reflected in fashion and hairstyles. Women now have more options than ever thanks to Clairol, which was the first hair color brand to be sold in grocery stores. The first hair color hotline, 1-800-CLAIRL, was founded in 1970 to offer free guidance to women regardless of the hue they ultimately chose. And now I kind of want to call this 1-800 number. I'm curious if it still exists. And another campaign, Love and Care, 1977, natural foods, herbal teas, and herbal mixtures for the body and hair became popular during this back to nature period in the nation. In order to be kind and kind to on hair, Clairol introduced the first shampoo in ammonia-free hair color in the market. In order to further assist women with color maintenance, Clairol Nice and Easy Lasting Touch became the first conditioner to be packaged with hair color in 1979. And into the 80s, all eyes on the hair, Shimmer Lights, the first shampoo to successfully lighten grays, was created by Clairol. First gel tube permanent hair color introduced in 1985 offered more accurate color application. Well, the 1980s, the decade of celebrity endorsements is when it all started. As Hollywood starlets have been providing hair color inspiration since the 1930s, brands began obtaining the biggest personalities in Hollywood. Think Sybil Shepherd and Heather Locklear to advertise their products. So it's so interesting to learn the history of hair dye, especially how it was so taboo before the 1950s. Jean Harlow was one of Hollywood's first true blonde bombshells. Her striking looks and natural talent quickly made her a star. Jean appeared in some of the most popular films of the 1920s 
and 1930s, including red dust and dinner at eight. Tragically, Jean died at the age of 26, but her legacy as a true Hollywood icon lives on. To this day, she is remembered as one of the most beautiful and talented actresses to ever grace the silver screen. When Marilyn Monroe was still in kindergarten, Jean Harlow was dazzling audiences with her seductive sexuality and striking blonde hair. Harlow was born Harlene Carpenter in 1911, was the first person to use the term blonde bombshell, which is now all but cliche. There were numerous explanations for why she died at the age of 26 after developing a strange illness. Some claimed it was a failed abortion, while others asserted it was excessive drinking brought on by a breakup. However, she may already be holding the solution in her thoughts. There was no such thing as gold and blonde before Harlow. There was no hair dye on the market that could make one's hair as blonde as Jean Harlow's, despite the fact that utilizing hair lighteners like hydrogen peroxide was nothing new. Famous neurotic Howard Hughes sought to give Harlow a nickname, similar to how Clara Bow and Mary Pickford had titles like The It Girl and America's Sweetheart. Hughes' PR director came up with Platinum Blonde after dumping brilliant ideas like Blonde Landslide and Darling Cyclone, before Howard Hughes became renowned for walking around with Kleenex boxes strapped to his feet, Hughes had the brilliant notion to offer $10,000 to the hairstylist who could match Harlow's hair color. No one could, not even in the 1930s during the Great Depression when money was scarce. That's so hard it was to replicate Jean Harlow's hair color. Although Harlow insisted she was naturally blonde, her stylist knew better. Hairstylist to the stars, Alfred Pagano, once remarked, I used to bleach her hair to make it golden blonde. Clorox, ammonia, peroxide, and Lux flakes were used. Are you sure about that? Using Clorox, bleach, ammonia, peroxide, and Lux flakes were used to dye Jean Harlow's hair. The main components of Clorox bleach today are the same ones that were used in the 1930s formulation. These components include something that when combined with ammonia produces a toxic gas, hydrochloric acid, and apparently a star worthy shade of blonde. Her hairdresser said she would have performed this grueling and unpleasant treatment on a weekly basis. Being a natural blonde, Jean decided to promote whiteness by shampooing her hair once a week with white soap and finishing with a few drops of French blue rinse, a blue peroxide rinse to get rid of yellow. She uses only water and vinegar to set her wave after brushing for smoothness. And there is a recipe for Jean Harlow shampoo. It's pretty easy to make and you use Kirk's Castile soap which was used by Jean Harlow and you grate this. And she then added three cups of hot water and combined it. After combining everything, you pour the mixture into a mason jar and leave it to chill overnight. Before washing her hair, Jean Harlow would massage warm, odorless castor oil into her scalp and she would then use the shampoo and I think the castor oil helped with regrowth and dryness. Harlow's hair started to fall out as the day of her death approached. It is well known that Harlow has doned wigs and she wore one while filming China Seas. After that, she either made the decision or had to change the color of her hair. She passed away after two years of doing this grueling hair dye. Saying that Harlow's hair color was solely to blame for her passing would be reductive. Her filmography and medical history together read like a Greek tragedy. Before turning 16, she reportedly got scarlet fever, meningitis, and polio. Then, while still wearing the title of Hollywood's hottest starlet, she underwent pneumonia, two abortions, got her appendix removed, 
She had several episodes of influenza and a terrible reaction to getting her wisdom teeth removed. Prior to her passing, she continued to work on the set. When Clark Gable went to see Jean Harlow on her deathbed, he observed that when he leaned down to kiss her, it was like kissing a dead person, a rotting person. She was exhaling waste through her mouth because she was unable to urinate and was instead doing so by her mouth. By that point, her body had doubled in size due to water weight. According to reports, Harlow felt better on June 3rd and was planning to return to the set. She went into a coma on June 6th and was declared dead the next day. Perhaps in preparation for surgery that never happened, the physicians had removed the hair that once distinguished her as an icon by shaving her head. Officially, Harlow passed away from kidney failure, which is essentially an accumulation of toxins over time as a result of the body's inability to eliminate waste. Since kidneys can still function at only 10% of their full capacity, this can occur over years with little warning. Fatigue, nauseousness, stomach pain, water retention, and skin graying were her initial symptoms. Additionally, she struggled to breathe while filming and began donning wigs because her recognizable locks were thinning. Although renal failure doesn't necessarily result in death today, it did in 1937. Dialysis equipment, kidney transplants, and even antibiotics were not accessible for Jean Harlow's condition. I feel like that would just be one of the worst deaths. Incredibly painful. Most biographers and first-person sources claim that Harlow's renal failure was caused by a side effect of her childhood scarlet fever. Her later binge drinking reduced her immunological response, which made her kidneys, which were already failing, work more difficult. However, lab rats exposed to chlorine gas have been shown to suffer kidney damage as well as other side effects. Harlow's exposure to this much ammonia and bleach every week, along with the scarlet fever and alcohol, may have contributed to her demise. Hollywood wouldn't know I'm alive, Harlow famously remarked, if it weren't for her platinum blonde hair. She may have gotten out of it thanks to the fact that Hollywood acknowledged her existence. According to reports, Harlow and her mother didn't get along well. A failing actress by the name of Mama Jean, she seems to have focused all of her ambition and broken aspirations on her daughter. Actually, Harlow, or Baby Jean as everyone nicknamed her, arrived in Hollywood only after her parents' divorce, at which point her mother sent her there to pursue a career as a celebrity. However, Baby Jean stole the show and Mama Jean remained deeply involved in her daughter's life and profession. Some contend that Mama Jean was at least partially to blame for the passing of her daughter. According to some accounts, Mama Jean, a Christian scientist, took her ill daughter home instead of having her receive a medical attention. A Christian scientist, Tony, argued that doctors did see Harlow in a piece for the Guardian. Christian scientists certainly believe in natural healing, he continued, but that doesn't mean they disregard a Western medicine when it's necessary. Regardless of the facts, Harlow's life could not have been saved by Western medicine. Harlow married MGM executive Paul Byrne in 1932. After only a few months of marriage, Byrne's body was discovered inside their house, and he was shot to death. There were rumors that Harlow had taken her husband's life, while some believed Byrne's ex-common-in-law spouse was to blame. Additionally, some suggest Byrne was a polygamist, while others assert he had little interest in women. However, Lewis B. Meyer later claimed to have discovered a note inside the house. When Byrne's butler discovered Byrne's body, he did not call the police. He dialed the studio instead, and they came and cleaned up. About Byrne's passing, Harlow remained silent. 
The tragedy and ensuing scandal prompted MGM to invite Tallulah Bankhead to play Harlow's replacement in a movie. Bankhead rejected, stating that it would be one of the shabbiest things ever to curse the radiant Jean Harlow for the tragedy of another. I let Mr. Meyer know about it. Harlow had a lot of negative press at the time, as if her second husband's naked shot body wasn't awful enough, Harlow had an affair with boxer Max Fair immediately following Burns' passing. Sadly, the boxer was still married. When organized crime visited Hollywood, Harlow mingled with them, including Bugsy Siegel. Harlow and Siegel ended up getting close enough that she served as a Millicent's unofficial godmother. MGM decided to intervene and attempt to restore Harlow's reputation following her failed relationships and extramarital affairs. Their finest thought, a fake union. Harold Rawson, a photographer, and Harlow were married by MGM. Unsurprisingly, eight months later, Harlow divorced for the second time in her life. Even though Harlow's life was terrible in many ways, she is remembered for more than just her platinum hair and early death. She was ahead of her time and even broke convention by including a steamy bathtub scene in one of her movies. In addition to avoiding censorship, the film was a big success. She says, men like me because I don't wear a brassiere. The actor William Powell was mentioned in Harlow's obituary from June 7th, 1937 as being by her side both during her illness and passing. Her frequent companion at social occasions in recent months, and Hollywood is convinced that there would be a marriage. According to the obituary, it was Powell that said, but that never came to pass. During the 1935 filming of Reckless, Harlow fell in love with Powell. According to some stories, the two never got married because Harlow desired children and Powell did not. Others assert that Powell and Harlow did get engaged, but Harlow was afraid Louis B. Meyer, the head of MGM, would forbid their marriage. Howard Hughes contributes to Harlow's notoriety and hair. Harlow arrived in Hollywood just as talkies were becoming a commonplace and Howard Hughes gave her the chance to take the place of a Norwegian actress in the Hell's Angel movie. She was given the nickname Platinum Blonde by Hughes' staff and she quickly rose to fame. Jean Harlow's toxic hair dye was the talk of Hollywood in the 1930s. The blonde bombshell used a deadly mix of bleach and peroxide to achieve her signature platinum locks and the dangerous concoction resulted in several trips to the hospital. Jean's hair dye was so toxic that it actually burned her scalp and she often had to wear wigs to cover the damage. Despite the risks, Jean's fans were desperate to emulate her look and many women resorted to using the same dangerous mix of chemicals. As a result, Jean's hair dye became synonymous with Hollywood glamour and it continues to be popular today. However, the dangers of Jean Harlow's toxic hair dye are now well known and women are advised to use caution when bleaching in their hair. Jean Harlow's untimely death at the age of 26 sent shockwaves through Hollywood. The world mourned the loss of one of its brightest stars, but few knew the truth about the toxic secret that had killed her. For years, Jean had been using a hair dye that contained high levels of lead and other dangerous chemicals, and these chemicals slowly poisoned her along with her other health problems, and her body eventually could not take it. As her fans remembered, they should also be aware of the dangerous risks associated with hair dye. Jean's story is a tragic reminder that sometimes the price of beauty is just too high. And thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and don't forget to check out my other toxic beauty videos. All right, see you guys again soon. Bye.